I'm uh, William J. Gerhardt, uh, an attending physician at Children's Hospital and have been assuming uh, the volunteer position of historian for Children's for the last 15 years when we worked up the uh, centennial uh, history of that great institution. We've been since then uh, recording by videotape the heritage of Children's Hospital through the eyes of those who made that history and really privileged today to have with us uh, Jennifer Logie who is the director of the Pediatric Clinical Pharmacology Division in the CHRF at Children's and also medical director of the Pharmacy Services. And she's been here at Children's since 1964 so that calculates out to be about 32 years. And then also Virginia Donaldson, who came to Children's in 1971, and that's 25 years ago, and functions as research immunologist. Um, both of these doctors have a lot to uh, tell us about what's been going on in the CHRF and in the Children's Hospital. And appreciate uh, both of you spending your time to be with us and recording this. Jennifer, let me start by asking you how it was growing up, playing in your backyard with hippos running around. <laughs> growing up in Africa. Well, it's pretty much like growing up in America, really. The hippos were far away. Okay. But you could see them from your yard. No, not really. Okay. And that was in uh, Zambia, Zambia, in Central Africa. Yeah, and it was Northern Rhodesia then. Okay, Northern Rhodesia. Right. They always had beautiful stamps that I saved, Rhodesia did. Do you great. still save stamps? Yes. Um, tell us then how you got uh, for your further training and how you pronounce Whitwater's Rand. <laughs> the medical school where Saul and Sam Kaplan trained, and you trained there. Right. And Jack just Luck how did you Luckman. get there, and what was your interest there? Well, there was no secondary education in, in Northern Rhodesia. Hmm. So we either had to go to England or to South Africa to go to high school. And my brothers and I both went to high school. It was a five-day train ride, and we went home three times a year. Um, and it was while I was at uh, high school that I decided I wanted to do medicine. So I went to the Witwatersrand. <laughs> Witwatersrand, good. Which just means white water reef where the gold is. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was at medical school there for six years. Six years? Yes, I, ours was the same as the British system, that we entered sure. medical school and then went through in sure. six years. And your degree then is... Um, in so biology and chemistry, right? No. No. What it, is that? It's M M M B B C H is Bachelor of Medicine. Okay. And Bachelor of Surgery, spelt the old way, C H I R U R G I E. Wow. Okay. You know, I should have known that all these years and did it. Thanks for. <laughs> <laughs> and then you did go to England for further training. Yes, I did go to England, and I came here for a year to see what American medicine was like. And I was supposed to go back to England and do my DCH and settle down. And here I am 32 years later. Yeah, that's great. It was a year in Louisville, was it? Six months. Six months. Just six months. And then a, a f just six months here as a senior no, resident? A, a year here as a, a senior year resident. Yeah. Senior resident. And then did you enter uh, Clark West's division right away on faculty, or how no, did you No, I was never in his division uh, at all. I went to, I did my postdoctoral training in clinical pharmacology at the College of Medicine with Tom Gaffney, actually, and their clinical interest was hypertension. So he and Clark sort of finagled mm -hmm. it that I then went into pediatric hypertension, but I never actually worked for Dr. West. Okay. 
I always wondered how you got, had your pharmacology background to pursue that since then. So it, it was here over was about here a year. It was here at the College of two, two years. Two years in pharmacology. That's wonderful. There Good. was no pediatric clinical pharmacology in the country at the time, so you had to wow. do it in an adult division. Okay. Virginia, you grew up in the New England area. No, yeah. I grew up uh, in Long Island Sound. Okay. <laughs> and then where? And um, went to the University of Vermont um, for university and medical school. Um, my training was at the University of Rochester at Strong Memorial Hospital and um, further training at Buffalo Children's Hospital and at Western Reserve in Cleveland Good. before I came here. And was it in Western Reserve where you started in your hematology background? Oh no, my interest in hematology was um, acquired uh, as a house officer at the University of Rochester. Um, as the, the training there is uh, geographically suited to close interdigitation between pediatrics and medicine. Um, the chairman of medicine was Larry Young, and he had a large league of uh, hematologists around who were interested in hemolytic mechanisms. So as a training clinician on that service, you learned how to work and think about, um, work up and think about hemolytic problems. That's really where I got interested in this sort of thing. Also bears on immunology, of course. Okay. And then further hematology training was at Western Reserve? Yes. And tell us how you were recruited for the blood bank down here. Oh, I'm not part of the blood bank. I thought you came here for, oh, Burns Institute no, it I, was. I uh, came here, um, I, be, I was, uh, I had, um, gone to work with Oscar Ratnoff while I was in my clinical hematology training at Babies and Children's. And um, about the first week I was there, all of my research interests are clinically based, Good. but about the first week I was there, I f came across a patient with a huge hematoma in his thigh that I recognized as being unusual. So I found my way to Oscar Ratnoff's lab and they worked up this patient to find that he had factor V deficiency. Well, that was the first factor V deficient patient in Ohio. <laughs> but I became okay. interested in this sort of thing thereafter. So I worked with Dr. Ratnoff after that in his lab and have always collaborated with him since okay. in uh, hemostatic mechanisms. Sure. And then it was 67 that you came down to Cincinnati? 60, end of 67. Mm -hmm. Okay. And tell to the us Burns Institute. your position there at the Burns Institute. Well, I was director of hematology. Okay. Um, and I was recruited uh, by Bruce McMillan and uh, mainly by Helen Glick, who thought that uh, who thought that I should come down and so she'd have somebody to talk to about blood clotting, <laughs> <laughs> in part. Yeah. And uh, we did uh, a lot of talking together. Um, we set up, for example, a Tuesday afternoon coagulation rounds in the Department of Medicine, which still goes on today. I was Good. there yesterday. Good. And was it mostly clinical work then for Burns, or mostly uh, research, or half and no, half? No, mostly or? research. Um, as you probably recognize, Burns patients are pretty inaccessible patients. They're isolated very carefully. Um, one works on the burn wound um, at a distance, usually with an animal model. Sure. And then how did you make the jump across uh, Bethesda Avenue? Well, that was an interesting, <coughs> interesting series of events. The, uh, the Shriners Burns Institute is administered from Chicago, and um, along the way a decision was made that they weren't going to support research anymore mm. on two weeks' notice. Mm. Um, I had come with a, as an established investigator of the American Heart Association, so I had outside funding. And um, I was about to go to Minneapolis, where I had a nice job offer, when Ed Pratt and Al Maurer came over and said, why don't you come to our place? And 
And Ed said, you can have some of, um, of Dr. Saban's space, but you better hurry up and decide about it before he changes his mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's great. Okay. And then, did he have uh, certain demands on your switching to immunology instead oh, no. of uh, hematology? I haven't switched to immunology at all. Okay. <laughs> The, um, the complement, uh, my interests in complement um, were based originally on a patient that I saw at the Cleveland Clinic, where I worked for a while in the research division, where they were principally interested in hypertension. And um, this patient had, um, didn't have a hemorrhagic disorder. She didn't leak blood from her blood vessels, but she leaked a lot of fluid from her blood vessels. And. Uh, just to make a long story short, she had a defect in her complement system that I was pursuing in the lab at that point. And uh, we determined that other people with this swelling disease also have this defect, and it's hereditary, and that they have hereditary angioneurotic edema and lack sufficient functional levels of the inhibitor of the activated first component of complement, which is a unique serum protein sure. that has a lot of functions besides regulating complement. Yeah. Uh, took Dr. West's interest for many, many years too, the whole complement oh, yes. yeah. thing. So you moved into the third floor then of the mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. research foundation, which was Dr. Saban's floor. And yes. it's what, now the fourth floor? It's now the fourth floor. Yeah. Dr. And you're still there on that floor all that time? Um, my office is what used to be his glassware washing room. <laughs> okay. He used to come and visit once in a while when I had an Italian fellow because okay. he, uh, he liked to, to try Italian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's great. Good. Jennifer, you be, were made uh, director then in 67, about your third year here of the Pediatric Clinical Pharmacology, uh, which was finally then made into a division in 74. Am I right on those I, figures? I don't, I don't remember any no, dates at but all. that's about it. And you jumped right into working with um, hypertension. And a lot of that was uh, clinical research. You used the uh, Clinical Research Center, the CRC, right for some of the patients' workups. We haven't talked about CRC before, but that came into being in 1963, and Dr. Schubert was Dr. Pratt's first full-time faculty okay. appointment, I believe, and that started up in February of 64. Um, why don't you share about your interest in hypertension and how you pursued that and who you've worked with and so forth. Well, um, to be perfectly honest, it wasn't an interest at all. <laughs> okay, I can see that. <laughs> um, but al almost all the clinical pharmacology units in this country, the adult ones, were autonomically oriented. And many of them uh, had an interest, clinical interest in hypertension. And because I was in an adult unit that had an <coughs> interest in clinical hypertension, Dr. Gaffney used to say to me, aren't you interested in hypertension? And I'd say, no, <laughs> hardly ever see it in pediatrics. And we'd have that oh. conversation. And then Clark West got a very difficult patient and uh, persuaded Dr. Gaffney that I should take care of her. And so I got more and more involved in hypertension and was in that era that we, <coughs> we determined really that essential hypertension starts in childhood. Mm -hmm. and uh, the, the figures for what caused various forms of hypertension significantly changed over the years. So that about 90% of mild to moderate hypertension in childhood is due to primary hypertension, inherited sort of, whatever we know about that condition. Sure. Uh, didn't, didn't you start uh, working on that with an AMA grant of some kind? Uh, heart Association, yes, heart. I've had a couple of heart associations. AHA. AHA grants, right. And my recollection is within three years you had about 67 uh, patients that you were following with yes. hypertension. Yes, it was amazing 
How Amazing. and actually, this this still is the largest referred referred population of children with hypertension in this country. We have somewhere between 200 and 300. See about 90 new patients a year now, and actually just had 11 referrals in the last two weeks. And you know, I attribute that to the pediatricians in the community yeah. who are looking for it and and uh, identifying it. Jennifer, do they usually come to you as pre-teenagers, or what age group presents to you? Initially, uh, we pr with the essential hypertension, we primarily saw 15, 16-year-old teenagers. Uh, as I think as obesity is increasing in this country and uh, at younger and younger ages, we're now seeing four and five year olds who are 70, 80 pounds and we don't identify any other form of hypertension other than they have a family history and they're overweight. So they become younger and younger. Jennifer, in 72, um, I have recorded that you became the executive medical officer of the Cincinnati Drug and Poison Information Center and then that was till 83 and from 83 on chairman of the pediatric advisory committee of that uh, poison control center. Uh, just tell us uh, briefly your involvement of that, with that. Um, when I was a senior resident at Children's, you may remember that the senior resident in the ED used to take the poison calls. Yeah. And uh, while I was doing my fellowship, there was an emergency room committee that asked if there wasn't, because I was in clinical pharmacology, if we could think of some better way of handling mm -hmm. the poison calls. And clinical pharmacology had a drug, drug information sent at that time. Uh, the boss was away in Scandinavia, <laughs> and I was acting director of his division, so we worked out a plan that it would become the Drug and Poison Information Center, with Len Siegel directing it. And I was very involved for many years and then became more peripheral. Uh, fundraising, you know, for that is such a difficult thing and Len really has worked terribly hard at keeping it going. Okay. And I think uh, Dr. Gruley, mm -hmm. actually another historical mm -hmm. figure, <laughs> took over yes. as uh, from, from my, he, he sort of took over my, my later role okay. and is still involved with the... Is Center. that after he was dean here? Yes. You mean sort right. of in emeritus status he yeah. yes. did that? Yes, Great. he's been working with them and, okay. and still is as far as I know. Yeah. Now I understand it's, the Drug Information Center is now going to move to children fairly soon. Mm -hmm. uh, children's. We've had, you know, over the years administratively when Lonnie Wright was here at Children's, uh, it was administratively responsible for the Drug and Poison Information Center and then it flip-flopped back to the Dean's office. Okay. But uh, Children's has been involved for a long time now and I think the last I heard is that they're sort of in the final negotiations. Good. Which is great. Near the emergency room or do you have any idea where? It, lo they'll be located? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't hear that. Gosh, I don't know if there's any space down there. I wouldn't think so, yeah. But you know, they're sitting on the bridge in the College of Medicine, they're sort of remote from clinical areas, but I think sure. with all the modern communications, sure. it's... But right. it would be, I think it would be important, you know, particularly as a resource for the house staff to drop by and, and, and be able to get drug information Excellent. instead of relying on other people yeah. to do it. And it's such a uh, boon to have that information available to all the area physicians. And most of our patients know the number and call directly and not go, go through us. So it's been a, a wonderful resource. Well, I think it saves the emergency room visits too, doesn't oh, yeah. it? Oh, yeah. That's lot. good. Yeah. Sure. They've expanded and expanded. Good. <coughs> Virginia, you are considered to be a distinguished medical investigator and have been held in high regard nationally and internationally for your work in immunology. You were the first woman president of the uh, prestigious Central Society for Clinical Research in 82 and 83 and have been part of many medical societies and editorial boards. 
Anything come to mind out of those experiences you can share? Um, <laughs> thousands of things. <laughs> um, I think that um, um, all of those things are um, fringe benefits of being in medical science and biological science. Um, you have a large coterie of uh, colleagues in other places and in other countries. Um, people think that I just like to travel sometimes, I believe, but it usually has to do with talking about science with somebody somewhere else when I do this. But that's <laughs> a tremendous fringe benefit. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It is. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, the uh, efforts that, um, one of the more gratifying efforts uh, that I put out, I think, was chairing a Gordon conference one year, in hemos a hemostasis Gordon conference, coagulation Gordon conference, early in the days of that particular Gordon conference. And uh, at their f conferences where you have a lot of leeway in programming, so that I was able to recruit some people who were working with genetic mechanisms, which had at that time not really uh, come into the coagulationist sphere of knowledge, to most of them anyway. So one of the things we did was to have a session on this sort of thing, how you yeah. clone genes and what have you. One of the speakers that I recruited was from Earl Davies' lab. It was Sandra Deegan, whom we have since recruited to Cincinnati, hmm. and she and her husband. At that time, she had cloned the human prothrombin gene for her PhD thesis. Um, so that something like that allows you some originality in doing things. The same thing is true if you're uh, the president of a society, you can set up a program that, uh, that is, uh, has your imprint on it. I, uh, the year that I was president, um, the AIDS epidemic was just getting underway, mm -hmm. really. So I put together a, a special symposium on AIDS at that point in Chicago, and uh, was rather successful, I think. It was fun yes. to do. Great. Did you publish the proceedings? No, it wasn't published. Um, in fact, the people who were participating in it specifically didn't want to be ob obliged to have mm. manuscripts mm. ready. They were all pretty burdened at that point, and uh, so well, I sure. agreed not to do it. So, Jennifer, um, you spent uh, a lot of time on the uh, hospital or staff, which is a committee for pharmacology, and I think, what, from 72 to the present time, you've been the chairperson of that and the rest of us rotate through, but you're the steady on there. Um, what has so come out of It's a life sentence. Yeah, it, <laughs> it sure sounds like it. What's come out of that committee? How have you helped us? Well, it, its primary function is to oversee safe therapeutics at Children's. And I think that of the committees there, it's probably one of the most active at seeing that we don't just make policies, as many committees do, but that we oversee drug use and try and make it as safe <coughs> as possible. So I think it's, it has been an effective committee. And when you say we rotate off it, every year I say who would like to go off, and I don't get many takers. So I think great. that that's a great uh, something or other. They like Excellent. to stay on it. But I do think it's an important active committee, particularly now that uh, we have a drug use uh, subcommittee and actually are able to look at, at how we are practicing medicine. Good. And you've been associated then with the um, American Heart Association and the local and the Ohio uh, with the work you're doing. Is that with grants primarily or do you do other things uh, with them? Oh. For a period of some years, I was a, a very active volunteer with the Heart Association locally in trying to develop local hypertension programs. But in the, uh, in the last few years, I haven't really been involved except getting grants from them. Okay. And tell us your involvement with uh, the National U.S. Pharmacopeia. 
Oh Lord, I was on that a long time. I was chairman of the Pediatric Advisory Board for many years Excellent. and um, used to check off to uh, Rock, what is it? Rock, what's the name of the place? That the USP is in, in Washington. But um, mm. I think um, it was helpful because I was in a phase then when we were starting to develop the clinical information that we could for the, the two uh, volumes that are well known now, US, USP dispensing information. Yes. And there was a lot of interaction with, with adult people and so forth on the executive committee, so okay. it was quite fun. Did Dr. Harry Shirky's time with the US Pharmacopeia overlap yours, or were you quite, quite a bit after I, his? I was quite a lot, a long yeah. time after he was, yeah. Well, and I can't honestly remember how long I was on it. It must have been 10 years or more. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have dates down for it. Dr. Wilson in Columbus took over from me. Okay. I think what's, as you know, in the last year, we've been <coughs> able to start a uh, history library at Children's, and we've been able to uh, obtain a copy of all of the um, Griffith, Mitchell Nelson textbook of pediatrics. The last one that came out last year was the 15th edition of the Nelson pediatrics. And you had uh, the chapter on uh, hypertension in the 10th and the 11th edition, which would have been 75 and 79. And uh, that impresses me because that's our uh, Bible of pediatrics and you contributed to that. Dr. Nelson also used to work me hard as a <laughs> reviewer when he okay. was in charge of the Journal of Pediatrics. Great. And uh, I enjoyed that work. Sure. Probably the most prestigious of the pediatric journals, the Journal of Pediatrics, which is back here in Cincinnati for its editorship now under Bill Balistrieri. But for many, many years, uh, Dr. Uh, Waldo Nelson was the editor of that too from Philadelphia, having by way of history come out of uh, Cincinnati Children's back in 1940. Uh, yeah, Bill Balistrieri is working us all quite hard too. Is he involving the most of the uh, specialties in editor? He even works me. Does he? <laughs> That's great. Ashley Weech used to work me too. Okay. <laughs> I should tell a story about Dr. Weech in that regard. I did a lot of reviewing for him for the AJDC yes. then. And he said to me one day, Jennifer, you're one of my very best reviewers. In fact, when I send your reviews back to people, I always say that he is one of our best reviewers. And I was so mad at him. <laughs> I mean, he, thought, you know, he thought he was, he was uh, really... Uh, complimenting on me and telling people that no. this was a male reviewer. But oh, that's terrible. That was, that was a bleak, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, uh -huh. That's terrible. So I thought that was quite fun in retrospect. Jennifer, you put in a lot of effort on the review board of um, human investigations at Children's too. How long did you do that? Oh, I inherited it from Fred Silverman, who I think inherited it from Bill Schubert. But it, re it really wasn't pretty, pretty well gelled in terms of its um, policies and procedures and stuff. So I had it for but 10 you years. It. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I really think I did organize it during those 10 years. And not a lot seems to have changed under Erwin, who has, Erwin Light, who's yeah. been chairman mm -hmm. now for over 10 years. Yeah. And you it did it from 74 to 84, and then he's done it since then? Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yep. What's your interest in uh, your lab now, Virginia? My lab? Yes. Oh, um, well, I am forever um, clinically involved with 80-some um, kindred that I have in my files with hereditary angioneurotic edema. Wow. Um, that's not a population I see very often, but it's a big telephone practice when mm. they have problems <laughs> or when their physicians have problems. Um, research itself at the moment focuses on a 
an anticoagulant substance uh, which we have isolated from human endothelial cells. It's a protein which um, impairs the surface activation of a clotting factor called Hageman factor. That's of potential importance because when Hageman factor is activated by injury or what have you, um, it can generate inflammatory substances in the blood called kinins, polypeptide kinins, which then can worsen the pathophysiology at hand. So if the cell itself has yet another way of down-regulating this, um, it's worth knowing about. It's a tough thing to isolate, but we have it in hand. Great. <coughs> Tell me what it meant to be chairman of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Children's Hospital since 80. Mm. I'm not chairman anymore. Oh. <coughs> I was chairman for about 15 years. Yes. Um, which was a good job. Enjoyed it very much. It's a good job for someone like me. Um, my clinical contacts around the Children's Hospital have been spotty, and um, I don't, I'm not an attending anymore. I used to do attending rounds. So that this is a way to have your ear to the ground as to what people are doing in the, in the institution in terms of personal research or divisional research. It's work but um, yeah. it's worthwhile. And 15 years of it. Mm -hmm. Great. I think so. Um, Virginia, a couple of years ago, our uh, historical committee, um, which we call the Children's Hospital um, Pediatric Historical <coughs> Society, uh, we established a hall of honor, so to speak, outside of the research auditorium elected you to that uh, Hall of Honor for all the work that you've been doing in your special field. And I, you know, I'm proud that um, we recognized you that way. I appreciate thi it. This uh, December, um, Dr. Logie will be recognized uh, as, with the Founders Award of the Children's, uh, of the Cincinnati Pediatric Society for the clinical research that she has done and all these chairpersonships that she's held and so forth. And you then will be on the Hall of Honor as of <laughs> December, Jennifer, and that's uh, great and uh, looking forward to writing you up and having your pretty picture that I got from B. Rose, and <laughs> we'll put that up there too. So that'll be a special time in December, yes, and they told me that you knew about it, so it's not a surprise, and we could mention it on the tape here. So True. Great. I, I had just come back from Scotland, actually, and okay. uh, I was talking to John Thalking about very mundane matters. Yes. And he slipped me a piece of paper, and I thought it was something from the Medical <laughs> Records Committee, and started to read, and I was really delighted. It's, Good. A, great, it's a great honor. Yeah, that's wonderful. Helen Berry was the first one so honored, and that was uh, about <coughs> eight times ago. Yes, about eight, I think. So that's fine. Um, I think we're coming to a conclusion, but is there something that I left out that we need to share as we complete the um, interview on what you've been involved with for all those years, both Dr. Donaldson and Dr. Logie? Jennifer, how about telling us about the uh, Women's Physicians Group uh, oh. that came about uh, for Dr. Rao's benefit initially, and well, what all you've been doing? Um, I don't know if it was Louise's benefit, but <laughs> <laughs> she and I used to uh, have lunch together now and then. And Good. one of the things we felt was that women physicians at Children's were rather isolated and didn't talk to each other very much. They tended to stay within their division. So a small group started having lunch together. You were, I think you mm -hmm. were part of that original Great. group. And uh, then ev eventually it involved into the Women's Faculty Association. And uh, now I think does rather more than 
just communicate. They, it's a more formal organization, if you will. Um, and they've produced a handbook for junior faculty and they're putting on a seminar for junior faculty in October, those sort of things. Uh, I think we more more active sort of uh, chatting amongst ourselves and, and uh, supporting each other. But one of the original efforts um, of the group was to establish the Louise Rao scholarship, scholarship for fourth year medical students in need of support. Um, early in the game. Right, that was a, a big fundraiser her family helped with a great deal. The women's mm -hmm. faculty yeah. spearheaded it and goes, continues on. Once a year they select a, a medical student actually I think going into the fourth year. Originally it was, it was a, um, a lectureship and we have so many of those. Right, and we have so many of those, and it, it didn't really work. It was supposed to be for mm. students bridging the, the, mm. uh, the c uh, clinical and basic science curriculum. Mm. So Louise was very willing to change it to a scholarship, because okay. you know she was always interested in Yeah, and, and the, the important thing is it was established while she was alive, right, and right. she could participate, just like Dr. Pratt's uh, research lectures with right former residents and so forth was established while he was alive and right. he could participate too. Mm -hmm. The first lectureship was Dr. Antoinette Parisi uh, Eaton, uh, who came down from Columbus, who mm -hmm. has served as president of the American Academy of Pediatrics right. and uh, has done a lot of uh, work for pediatrics uh, nationally mm -hmm. as well as statewide. I happened to serve the same year with uh, Tony as chief residents. We were both chief residents together at Columbus Children's back in 59-60. Uh, so our relationship goes way back then, and it was great to have her down here for your first lecture there. Is she still very active? Yeah, she's still active, uh, and she's still quoted you know, in different mm -hmm. AAP newsletters and things like that, and still speaking on behalf of children. Good for her. Yeah. Anything else come to mind? Not really, just that it's grown so much one hardly recognizes yeah, it. Yeah, you're right. And hard to find <laughs> your way around these days. Not a, to mention they change the numbers of the floors that you work on. Huh? <laughs> That's great. Dr. Logie, thanks so much, and Dr. Donaldson, thanks so much, and this Thank has you. been a good time together. Thank you very much. Good.